Thank you, Kate, <clears throat> for those kind words of introduction and for the uh, tantalizing sliver of the Dartmouth address that I missed two and a half years ago. I can't wait for the rest of it. <laughs> uh, unlike the, uh, the climate of jealousy, intrigue, and what was it all, backbiting and suspicion. Uh, my experience in Phi Beta Kappa is one of continuing friendships and and stimulating conversations in different venues. As I look around this room, I think of having been with Kate Monday of this week at an executive committee meeting in D.C., having been with Jacques a few weeks ago at a meeting of the New York Association in New York City, seeing John Chandler in Washington at the AAC and U meetings not too many weeks ago, and Stephen, our lunch in Boston. It's a sort of a, my professional work is a, a mapping of the country uh, with uh, friendships at the nodes of the, of the interchanges. So it's a pleasure to be here today, and I want to thank Stephen Miller for the invitation to come and be a part of this and add yet another word of congratulation to Gamma of Massachusetts on your sesquicentennial. And I, I'm very thankful that it's such a round number and not one of those more difficult ones. Um, I'm an inductee of Gamma of Tennessee, so I will claim kinship uh, on that basis as well. And I want to say a word of thanks to Bill Arms for his participation in Phi Beta Kappa's Visiting Scholar Program. Bill's visit here today is one of a hundred such visits by a stable of 14 or so eminent and distinguished scholars from around the country who are doing Phi Beta Kappa's work in, in such splendid fashion. Well, Phi Beta Kappa's been around a long time, as Kate's dates uh, give you an indication, since 1776, where we began as a convivial debating society. The word convivial is an allusion to liquids of the sort we have before us today. And in the early 19th century, we gained our character as the most recognized Society Honoring Excellence in the Liberal Arts and Sciences. And today we have 283 chapters at colleges and universities around the country. Every year we induct something like 18,500, 19,000 new members. Total membership, living memberships, about 600,000. And that uh, includes a very wide spectrum of folks. Seven of the nine sitting justices of the U.S. Supreme Court and one who isn't a member actually subscribes to the American Scholar. Uh, th the person who I hope continues to be the starting quarterback of the Denver Broncos, a number of high-tech titans, and hundreds of thousands of people who are putting their liberal arts education to use for the betterment of society in a wide variety of professions. Now, in recent years, Phi Beta Kappa has enlarged its sense of purpose beyond the core functioning function of recognizing and celebrating high achievement. The accomplishments of our members are worth recognition because they've done very well at something very important. So we're increasingly turning our attention to advocacy, seeking greater public awareness of the role of the arts and sciences, not only in leading to individual success, but also in creating common good. Recently, I was in a conversation with the chair of the National Endowment for the Humanities, William Adams, who goes by Bro. He's a former president of Colby College. <clears throat> Bro said his hope for his tenure at the NEH was to raise awareness through the country of the humanities' contributions to the common good. That's a worthy goal, and one that Phi Beta Kappa embraces as we work to increase awareness of the importance of the social sciences and the natural sciences and mathematics as well as the humanities. Now everyone here is aware of the national conversation about the purposes of higher education and the way that conversation so often focuses on the economic consequences of college for the individual and the short range consequences at that. At Phi Beta Kappa we're concerned about the short shrift being given to broader perspectives perspectives that are broader in terms of the individual's interest in seeking higher education, and broader also in terms of the impact of higher education on the texture of society as a whole. So we have engaged in, and are now about 15 months into, a National Arts and Sciences Initiative. 
Our aim is to add depth and breadth to that national conversation. We want to add depth by extending the focus of the questions about consequences into long-range considerations about people's whole careers, not just their first jobs. We want to add breadth by casting light on the purposes of higher education that stretch beyond enhanced salaries and workforce preparation. Those further purposes are deeply rooted in the American commitment to higher education. You can look to Jefferson, Adams, or examine the studies and career of Madison, and you find an insistence that a big part of having colleges and universities is to prepare a citizenry with the knowledge and, equally important, the deliberative dispositions to make a participatory democracy work. Recently, Hunter Rawlings published commentary on Madison, and I want to quote him at length. This is Hunter. Long before he became a president, a secretary of state, or a member of Congress, and took the lead in writing our Constitution, James Madison was a boomerang kid. He received a traditional liberal arts education at Princeton, studying history and literature and philosophy, with an emphasis on the ancient Greeks and Romans, learning how to debate and declaim. He mastered the rudiments of what today we call science. When Madison graduated, he had no idea what to do with himself. So he asked Princeton's president, John Witherspoon, if he could stay on an extra year to pursue Hebrew and theology with him. That year completed, Madison still did, know what, did not know what to do, so he went back home to Virginia and lived with his parents. In our hyper-utilitarian view of the purpose of college today, Madison would be considered a failure at this point in life. And his education would be considered a waste, and Princeton would lose points in somebody's rating system. As we know, Madison never did find a job. Instead, a cause found him. When the revolution began, Madison used his liberal education to become the recognized expert on self-government, republicanism, federalism, and freedom of conscience. All of these ideas were based on what he had learned at Princeton. But equally important, he had learned how to analyze problems and conduct research, how to argue in public, both verbally and in writing. This was a liberal arts education that benefited an entire nation. That's Hunter Rawlings. Back to my comments. Madison, of course, was an unusual case, and our fervent hope is that the benefits of education in the arts and sciences continue to spread far beyond the privileged class that Madison represented. And few of us, I hope, will be called on to draft a constitution or to maneuver that document through ratification. But all of us, as citizens, should have in some measure a sense for the warp and woof of civic and political life in a way that strengthens the fabric of society to the benefit of all. Closely related is the idea that colleges and universities, by educating broadly, sustain the civic and cultural life of a society, creating an environment for the infrastructure of organizations and the complex of social activities that distinguish a flourishing culture from a utilitarian engine of production and consumption. And related to that is the idea that such a flourishing culture, in its rich diversity, provides the context for meaningful and fully humane lives. Phi Beta Kappa, for the purposes of our National Arts and Sciences Initiative, boils this down into three statements. Arts and sciences open opportunity. Arts and sciences drive ingenuity and innovation. Arts and sciences are an investment in America. That's our elevator speech. And as the elevator doors open, we go on to say that arts and sciences do these things because they stimulate critical inquiry. They stimulate sympathetic imagination and enhance our inclination and ability 
to engage in deliberative thought. Now, as we leave the elevator, the speech continues thus. Training may be preparation for the predictable, but liberal education is preparation for the unpredictable. It's education for all of life. Now, we've all seen the headlines about the importance of making college pay off and the comparison of entry-level salaries by college major, and we've seen the not very subtle reduction of the purpose of higher education down to a very narrow and short-sightedly short -sightedly exclusive economistic metric. Can this degree get you a job right now, and what will it pay? Now, please understand that I do understand that preparation for a remunerative career is an important part of college. But it isn't just the first job that counts, it's the career. And there is life beyond paid work. There is citizenship, civic life, family life, and the fullness of human experience. Phi Beta Kappa's aim is to enlarge the discussion of the purposes of higher education, deepening the economic focus, and bringing attention to a wider and more inclusive spectrum of human goods. So let me expand the elevator speech. First, liberal arts and sciences and large opportunity. Full access to the ladder of opportunity depends not only on training for the first job, but also on education that equips people for more. In an egalitarian society, that means that the benefits of arts and sciences should be as widely accessible as possible because everyone deserves a shot at this kind of learning and everyone can benefit in some way. Phi Beta Kappa does believe in the intrinsic value of studying arts and sciences for their own sake. But it's also important to say that arts and sciences education provides lifelong economic opportunity in a constantly shifting job market. Students applying for college today can expect to hold a variety of jobs through the course of their career. By engaging students in a variety of subject matters and disciplines and different points of view, the arts and sciences provide flexibility and resilience. In what human endeavor do we not need communication capacities, reading, writing, speaking, listening, critical and analytic thinking abilities, intellectual flexibility and resilience, the capacity to, main, to entertain multiple perspectives, the cultivation of sympathetic imagination. The second thing Phi Beta Kappa is saying is that the arts and sciences drive innovation and ingenuity. As the national and world economies evolve, securing new jobs and crafting fulfilling lives will depend critically on ingenuity, the ability to see things in new ways, generate creative ideas and products, and innovation, the capacity and willingness to create novel means to success. Success in a globalized world requires knowledge and adaptability to other cultures. Students in the arts and sciences are accustomed to engaging widely disparate subjects. And while some American political leaders question the value of the arts and sciences, Countries like Singapore and China see a liberal arts education as key to innovation and imaginative thinking. What an irony it would be if America stops cultivating its seedbed of creativity in the liberal arts and sciences, just as their power is taken up abroad. The third message Phi Beta Kappa brings is this. Arts and sciences are investment in America. I've spoken of their economic value, but the arts and sciences are an investment in the country's life as a democracy. To be a participatory citizen, you need to make choices well, and you need to make good choices. We also need, as a society, a well-educated supply of those whose career choices have been shaped by a sense of societal purpose. Several years ago, when we asked large numbers of old members of Phi Beta Kappa about what had been of most lasting value about their liberal arts experiences, they gave a consistent answer, deliberative skills. If it's the dream of a democracy that a great 
multifarious multitude should find, if not common ground, at least accommodation and ways forward through persistent difference, then deliberative skills are essential to the flourishing and maybe even to the survival of democracy. We're not through figuring out in this country just what that grand phrase, e pluribus unum, quite means. It seems less and less likely that it will ever mean that difference disappears into indistinguishable sameness, and it seems unlikely that that would ever have been a good thing. But if it means finding a shared process for participation by disparate stakeholders, if it means the continuity of that process from one historic moment to the next, and if it means recognizing that even as the process itself changes, there's a skein of commonality from the beginning, then realizing the promise of a pluribus unum seems uniquely dependent on maintenance and refinement of the very skills that advocates and beneficiaries alike of the liberal arts and sciences have always claimed for them. Many of us were subjected in our own educations to what's known as a Whig interpretation of history. The term comes from the title of a 1931 book by English historian Herbert Butterfield, and it refers to the English political party who opposed, opposed the Tories and championed the prerogatives of Parliament from the late 17th century into the middle 19th. A Whig interpretation casts the past as a progression or ascent of events, sometimes bathed in an aura of near inevitability, climbing toward the culminating pinnacle we now occupy. I offer as an example my sixth grade world history textbook. It was called, world history mind you, it was called Prelude to American Democracy. The Greeks and Romans may not have known it, but they were all about us. Now education about our social and political heritage in relation to our contemporary situation does remain contentious. Recently, the board of the second largest school district in Colorado debated an action prompted by opposition to new AP history standards. Some members sought to ensure that courses, and these are the words of board member Julie Williams, present positive aspects of the United States and its heritage and promote citizenship, patriotism, the essentials and benefits of the free enterprise system. Similar reactions to the AP history course have been reported in Tennessee, Texas, South Carolina. Now, ironically, this expression of hope that the county board not adopt standards seeming to condone or encourage civil strife led to demonstrations, sick outs, walkouts, and piles of signed petitions. One attendee at the board's meeting brandished a copy of George Orwell's 1984. Someone else waved a placard inscribed, America was founded on what you are trying to prevent. Now this is a big deal. According to the Washington Post, 440,000 students across the country took the AP history exam last year. What's at stake is the history available to a big swath of American youth. Or if we go to the supposed roots of our democracy, fans of the Greeks need to watch out too. It's important to remember that the Peloponnesian War was won by the authoritarian Spartans, not the off and on democratic Athenians, and that Athens was in one of its democratic moods when its assembly condemned Socrates to the hemlock. It's also good to remember that the charges against Socrates were modeled on the stock complaints against teachers of rhetoric, the so-called sophists, who were said to inquire into things in the heavens and under the earth, to make the worse argument appear the stronger, and to corrupt the youth by leading them away from the truths that gave stability to the city. Maybe not much changes. Education in the U.S. now exists in a field of tensions, and I make that word tensions plural because one dimension, as shown in the Colorado example, reflects very different views of what's true about American history and what social function the teaching and learning of history ought to accomplish. While another dimension of tension about education reflects different views of how education ought to feed the economy. We need welders and programmers, not anthropologists and sociologists, as a couple of governors have said more or less 
in the last couple of years. And from surveys that get reported seemingly weekly, you can find out that higher education leaders tend to believe that their graduates are prepared for the job market, while business leaders seem not to agree. You can discover that very many business leaders will say that they seek, seek most avidly in hiring candidates the very attributes that proponents of liberal arts and sciences assert their graduates to possess, while academic types seem not to be doing a convincing job of making the case or the hiring managers aren't hearing it. This disconnect is another dimension of the tension. And add to the rise in, as it now seems, seriously weakened state of for-profit higher education, which seems to have turned out to have been an engine of publicly backed loan sourced revenues for owners and investors, but more, more often a, so a source of financial wreckage than education or degrees for the students. These concerns magnify the tensions of access, cost, and stratification, with some people noting that the typical baccalaureate student debt amounts to the price of a modest automobile, while others argue cogently that the patterns of college admission and completion in this country contribute substantially to the increasing stratification of wealth and income at a level, indeed, that could destabilize our political order. When large numbers of people come to believe that they have no stake in the system, there is risk. Add to this the tension between those who call for civility on campus as a condition for the pursuit of truth and those who, in the name of freedom of expression, hear the word civility as dog whistle code for constraints that would inhibit or even prohibit some speech. The country seems to need a clear-headed conversation about the purposes of education with a, a broad and a long-term view, taking into account not only education for personal economic success and contribution to the national and world economies, but also citizenship and the sustaining of a democratic participatory society and the creation and maintenance of a social order in which the most people possible can meaningfully seek their own well-being and that of their families, their communities, in the world. Some recent studies have suggested that when people who disagree about important things exchange their views in orderly argument, explaining to each other what reasons underlie their differing positions, they typically come away each more firmly entrenched than before. Now this is disheartening news for people who believe in the power of reason who value argument, who think that the pursuit of truth is a matter of giving and hearing reasons for beliefs. Well, what is an argument? The correct, concise definition is found in one of the classics of Western philosophy, and I mean Monty Python's skit, The Argument Clinic. An argument, we are told there, is the assembly of reasons in support of a proposition. But assembling reasons doesn't mean that anyone will pay, pay attention to them. If argument is the assembly of reasons, deliberation is the weighing of reasons. The word comes from the Latin for scales. To deliberate is to ask how it is that the reasons we assemble are reasons, to ask how and why they count. When people who disagree weigh their own reasons and those of others in this way, they are no longer arguing, they are examining arguments. In a strong sense, they are examining each other, and if they are deliberating in good faith, each is examining him or herself as well. If we are committed to the resolution of disagreement by means other than force, whenever possible, then we have to be committed to the cultivation of the disposition and ability to deliberate. Deliberation is important because the fact of diversity is one of the most dominant features of our era. It is simply an inescapable fact of the world we live in that people disagree, not only in definitions and not only in what facts are the case, but also, and often in troubling ways, in the judgments they make about the relevance of admitted facts to conclusions about what is right and wrong, what ought to be done, in other words, about the meaning and importance of the facts. People differ in their fundamental uptakes on things, an uptake may be rooted partially in human nature or in different acculturations or in having been trained into particular communities of practice and God knows where else. Differences of uptake 
amount to difference of value. And that's where we can still be at loggerheads after we have agreed on the facts. Martha Nussbaum has done perhaps as, any, as much as anyone to show how the cultivation of sympathetic imagination and the deliberative approach it engenders lies at the heart of liberal education. Analysis of arguments, evaluation of evidence, command of the principles of logic and argumentation and rhetoric are all important, but the best and toughest work comes when disagreement arrives at the point where what one party admits as decisive evidence for some momentous conclusion the other party deems insufficient or even irrelevant. That's the point we, we come up against when we can't see how people apparently as fully human as we are could possibly accept the reasons they do for the conclusions they reach. And this is the point where logic rests on something very much like aesthetics. This is also the point where carrying forward the effort to understand others, and even more, the effort to understand ourselves, demands large capacities of sympathetic imagination. You have to be able to see how the other person could take the facts as warranting the conclusion she reaches. You have to be able to get some critical distance on the fact that you yourself may be taking some things as reasons that others find outlandish or beside the point. Socrates said that the whole game was about the maxim, know thyself. And to do that takes more than critical acuity and analysis and cleverness. It takes imagination and sympathy and an admission that knowing oneself requires an earnest, laborious comparison and contrast with other ways of thinking and being. Intentional cultivation of a range of sensibilities acquired most likely in deliberative engagement with tough cases. Genuine deliberation is a delicate business that works well only in a context of trust and restraint. The merit that lies in advocacy of civility is that an institution devoted to the arts and sciences must be devoted to the maintenance and protection of cultural spaces where deliberation can occur and is positively encouraged. But it need not insist that all social spaces be deliberative in character or that all speech meet a standard applicable to a deliberative seminar. It depends on what is being said, by whom, where, to whom, for what purpose, and how. Just as on the one hand, an institution, by requiring all civility all the time, can chill freedom, so the failure to protect some cultural zones as conducive to deliberation can forfeit the commitment to the pursuit of truth. Now, I'm not saying that we succeed, even in trying to deliberate, very much. I am saying that we should try more. I'm not saying that we are naturally disposed toward it. I am saying that we need to try to teach and learn it. I'm not saying we're very good at it or that it necessarily succeeds or even succeeds very often. I'm not saying the effort will elicit a reciprocal generosity of spirit. It may or it may simply get us duped and cheated. I am saying that if we have an obligation to avoid violence as far as possible, then we have an obligation to cultivate and exercise the skills of deliberation. I spoke earlier of tensions, of the educational process existing in a field of tensions. There are no formulaic resolutions of such tensions as this one, no simple recipes for the right way to do things, because cases are different. Our aim must be to maintain institutions that honor diversity and also truth and seek inclusive ways forward. I neglected to say at the outset that Phi Beta Kappa stands for a phrase that translates as love of learning is the guide of life. That motto points to a very practical end and Phi Beta Kappa as an organization is now advocating for learning in the arts and sciences with these three points, opportunity, ingenuity and innovation, and investment in the future of the country through the cultivation of these deliberative abilities. Well, it's an honor to be engaged with all of you in this shared effort. Again, I congratulate Gamma of Massachusetts on your sesquicentennial, and thank you all very much.